Welcome to the Loins of History. My name is Jay, and I'm joined by my co-host, Colin. And in this episode, we're going to talk about the early second industrial revolution here in the United States and how that gave rise to socialism as we know it here in the United States. So tail end of the 1800s going into the 1900s. Thanks, Jay. So, Colin, and this is going to be a really what exciting are episode. Some of our themes uh, and as we were doing our research, we thought this might end up being one episode. Turns out that uh, this whole mini series is almost turning into a, a separate podcast by itself. So it really good stuff. Um, you know, I want I want to start off by saying that there's really two <laughs> narratives that begin in this second industrial revolution, and the first is that of the capitalist. Think of it as the the booming economy, the robber barons, the captains of industry. They believed that this booming economy, this westward expansion, this industrialization, this um, rise of mass production and goods for the American economy, that helped everybody. They were able to pay more wages. And, you know, so you have one side and it's really, it's in the interest of the owner of production, the one that has the capital, the wealth, while the other narrative that begins to take place here believes that the workers are exploited, that there is a dark side to this industrial revolution. And a lot of this socialist movement was a reaction to the industrial revolution. Work conditions were changed. Um, we had never worked like this before in our history. And in books like Upton Sinclair's The Jungle, he really exposed the dark side of what life was like for the uh, American worker at the time. So you have these two competing narratives. And I think it's really important that we maintain that frame of reference that on the one side, everything is great and we're booming. The other side is that it's that boom comes at the expense of the American worker. And so some of the takeaways that I want us to have for this episode to keep in mind over the next 30 so minutes is that this is a fundamental change in the way Americans worked. So you know, last two episodes, we talked about this kind of old world, new world mercantilism um, economy. And one of the best ways I've heard it put is that prior to the Civil War and the American Revolution, Americans typically worked for their livelihood, meaning that it was an agrarian society where families worked the fee- the land for their food. They made their clothes. There were some shops and some small factories, but you really kind of made your own stuff you've provided for your family and you may work long hours, but you worked and then you took away the fruits of your labor. Whereas now you were working for your wages. You provided uh, an unskilled amount of time. You know, you were an unskilled labor a lot of times and you put in some hours and you got a wage and that wage became everything. So that was within a generation, a, a tectonic shift in the way we worked. Um, Also with the hours that we worked before, like I mentioned, when you're working for your livelihood, it's typical in agrarian society to work from sun up to sun down, but there was no mandated breaks. There was no um, 17, 18 hour days that were mandated by a supervisor. So I just want to keep that in mind as one takeaway. The next one is, like I mentioned, the socialist movement was a reaction to these perceived wrongs. It didn't just happen out of nowhere. Um, they believed that they were being exploited, and there's a lot of a lot of prudent or a lot of evidence to support that, and we're going to get into that. But they believed that they were being exploited. What they were being forced to do was wrong, and they collectivized or they made a collectivist movement in order to facilitate change to better their conditions. And with the final one, a lot of that collective bargaining that we I just mentioned led to a lot of the modern laws and rights that we as workers have now. Um, man, you know, uh, I think it was Taylorism that they had where they actually went through and scientifically began studying like how many breaks we would need. They used data and experts to come in and talk about, okay, you need this many breaks. This is how many hours you can work. This is how many days you can work. Child labor laws, minimum wage, a lot of those things uh, began with this, um, you know, because of this collectivist bargaining. So, um, those are the takeaways. There's there's so much to say <laughs> with those themes and those takeaways. But one of the one of the emotional uh, reasons for why I think we should be talking about this is it's obvious that 
the issues the a lot of the issues economic issues social issues that we see going on here in the United States today are literally over, like hundreds of years old you know and specifically like like a minimum wage right an 8 hour work day there were labor unions that were going on strike for these kinds of things if we want to uh make society a better place to live in we have to understand where the other side is coming from right because and like you said for like our uh our our second main takeaway here this stuff doesn't occur in a vacuum it in a lot of ways what i was thinking about colin when you were t- listing out the two different narratives is the one of the main differences between the two narratives is a difference of perspective, right? These workers, these wage laborers, they're not reading Adam Smith, right? Like, frankly, they probably didn't even care about, you know, macroeconomics, like the best way to to run a society. They're just trying to put food on their table, right? So they're not looking at socialism from like this theoretical, like, oh, this is the superior narrative. They're just wow, like the GDP is really, you know, we're doing great. <laughs> on the, GDP yeah. looks looking really good. Right. Like <laughs> they, they don't care. As a matter of fact, probably even today, the maj- the vast majority of Americans don't care. They're just trying to like in their own little perspective or their own individual perspective of the world. They're just trying to put food on the table. They're just trying to be happy. And whatever idea sounds good to them, they will do. So, and I say all that to say, in order for us uh, who maybe aren't socialists, we have to understand where they're coming from in order to reason, in order to debate, in order to you know move forward as a, as a nation in, in the right direction. No, that that's great because I think we've said it over the past two episodes, but this is a, a great way to look at it and say that America is not, this is not like a, it's not like the two party system when it comes to capitalism, socialism, in that we are neither as a, especially today, we are neither a capital, fully capitalist nor fully socialist society. We exist on a spectrum and it's important to realize that. So you don't automatically hear minimum wage laws or, you know, some other workers' right or a union and automatically discredit it thinking that it's socialist, nor should you say, well, I don't, I'm against private ownership of property because it's, it's what those capitalists think. It's, we exist in a country, economically speaking, on a spectrum, and it's important to recognize that. Some pe- some economists call that a mixed economy. However, I do want to say that we we are not fully capitalist, but we are capitalist. In, we definitely in, lean that way. Yes, that's- yeah. In in socialist definitions, uh, I mean, just Marx, right? In Marx's own words, you are not socialist until there's no such thing as private property. Like private property equals capitalism in the socialist's own definition of of how things are. So by that fact alone, we're capitalist. However, like we mentioned in our last episode, there's certain tenets of capitalism that we don't follow, free trade probably being the biggest one. But to Colin's point, like if you hear someone say we're a mixed economy, it's it's definitely inaccurate to try to equivocate like, oh, we are e- we are, you know, one part socialist, one part equal part capitalist. That's not accurate at all. <laughs> yeah. I, w- <laughs> I should say we're not fully realizing Adam Smith's wealth of nations, but we are, right. we do have some facets of what we would- We have somebody, a minimum wage. Yeah. We That's have a absolutely wage. socialist. Yeah, exactly. Right. We allow collective bargaining with unions. It's, Adam Smith would not like that. <laughs> right. Right. <laughs> so- it, with that being said, you know, the other thing I wanted to say is that, Jay, to your point about understanding the other side and this conflict between capitalists and socialists, we're seeing a lot of it today. You know, there's always talks about wealth inequality. And I think now instead of it being industrialist, it's like tech giants and, you know, big pharma, big oil, whatever. Um, that this conflict has been happening for a long time. And 
history doesn't always repeat, but it does rhyme. So it's important. This is a great spot to look back to and say, okay, here's, here's a, here's where this conflict didn't originate, but it evolved. And a lot of what we're seeing now happened then let's, let's see where we're, we're coming from so we can find a solution. So to provide a little bit of context as we get into this, as what to what America looked like at this point, the Civil War really fueled the Industrial Revolution because we went to one national currency. The North went into wartime production, so they were building factories. They were, in order just to support the war and to finance the war, um, they really had to leverage their industrial weight in it to win the war. You know, the U.S. is when it comes to the resources required for the Industrial Revolution, within the United States alone, we had massive oil reserves, coal, iron, rivers to transport these goods across the country. And we have the most contiguous arable land in the world. And we're protected by two massive oceans. So we were really primed for the Industrial Revolution. And oh, by the way, a massive wave of immigrants coming from Europe, specifically Irish, Italians, um, other non uh, Great Britain, uh, Great Britain uh, immigrants from Great Britain, I should say. So you had a lot of these new immigrants who were unskilled labor. I think that's important to point out coming into the U.S. So the U.S. population, because uh, of immigration, this massive amount of food and industrialization went from. I think 40 million to about 76 million in about 40 years. So that's almost doubling in 40 years. That's massive. And our economy went from about the th a third of the size of Great Britain to the largest in the world in about 30 years. So this industrialization happened within a generation. So, you know, if you're a, a millennial or a Gen Z, think about when we talk about, um, boomers and gen x and not being able to convert a pdf the amount of time that this occurred over really was an 10 or 15 years so you know whereas now if you were born in the 80s you know how to convert to a pdf if you're born in the 70s you probably don't um it's very similar like in one generation in a few years you saw a true change in the united states so I just want to throw that in there for a little bit of humor but I do think it's important to understand that this happened very very quickly especially if you throw it into context of how things moved, the speed at which history moved at that point. So Jay, where does that leave workers in the United States? Yeah. So socialist ideals had been permeating in continental Europe for decades. You know, we mentioned in the United States and it's interesting you talk about immigration uh, because a lot of early socialist thinkers here in the United States were actually German immigrants uh, that were all adherents to like Marx and Engels. But because the United States has been really agrarian until the time that Colin had just mentioned, there was really no like reason for us to to go full into uh, to read Marx because it was like there's just not that many factories until really immediate. Uh, the immediate beginning prior to the civil war. And then especially in the years afterwards, you have all these factories, the Northeast is industrializing rapidly. All of a sudden people start reading Marx and people start reading all these other socialist thinkers. And one of the early ways or the first ways in which this was expressed was you had these utopian communities being formed here in the United States. So only, only going to talk about one in particular, and it's kind of the the big one that the historians like to talk about, and that is uh, Robert Owen in New Harmony, Indiana. Uh, Robert Owen was a Welsh businessman who had become very very wealthy in um, you know during the British industrialization, and he had been reading these socialist thinkers, and he's like, I want to try this out. I want to go and form this like pure experiment. So he moves to the United States, buys a town in the southern, southwestern corner of what's current Indiana, and basically does this social experiment called New Harmony. And he tried to create this town that lived on pure socialist ideals. Just giving, for the sake of time, one example you could work or you could not work in in this town and it was totally up to you. And the idea was that the people that would work would provide the ability for people who didn't work 
uh, you know, to still get food on their table. And the way that the, the rule, the way in which this was done was there was no money in the way that we think of it. Rather, your earnings for working was like credit at the store. I know that sounds a lot like currency, but it, it wasn't like the same way that uh, we think of like, here's dollars, here's your wage. That's not what it was. And then if you you could not work and if you if you didn't work, you could exchange money for credit at the at the store. So this idea was that like you were still contributing, but if you didn't want to work, that's cool. And if you wanted to work, that was cool too. Long story short, interestingly enough, there was a worker class that formed and a non-worker class that formed. So instead of the rich and the poor, you had the workers and the non-workers. It was super interesting that they even – even this social particular socialist experiment, they couldn't afford the division of class uh, in in their society, and this was kind of one of the main reasons why the the community fell apart within two years. Uh, Robert Owen actually only spent just a few months at the community himself because he spent wait for it he spent the vast majority of his time asking wealthy people for donations to support the community. So he was traveling most of the time and he was like, hey, the only way this community can function is if rich people just through philanthropy give us their money. I think that's fascinating. (laughs) Uh, But that was one of the main utopian communities that formed. It it failed. It officially, it it basically was over within the first two years uh, but officially dissolved uh, two years after that. So four total years of, of new harmony uh, going on. There were other utopian communities, but that's kind of one of the more the more famous ones. I give this example to not just bash socialism and say, "Look, it failed!" Ha! Like that's not that's not the main reason why I give this example. the The reason I laugh and the reason why I give the example is socialism in what we see here. It struggles to put the grand ideal, the grand narrative into a concrete, actionable plan that actually works. The it's almost like one way this this might be a little unfair. The the capitalists um they're focused on the means and just kind of like, hey, whatever the result is, what the result is, like we're gonna make a lot of money, but what kind of society that turns into is of lesser concern. That's slightly unfair. Whereas the socialists, on the other hand, are like, we have this grand dreams for a perfect society, and we have no clue how to actually get there. And we see that in the in the New Harmony, Indiana community. Yeah, Jay, you're right. The uh, the capitalists definitely are seeking to make a profit. And, and to be honest, this is a really good time to make a profit in the United States. If you think about it, the Civil War happened it, when it ended there was a lot of opportunity. As I mentioned, we we're industrializing and there was the westward expansion. So people had to get out west, go find gold, go find land. And the way to do that was railroads. And railroads really, that was one of the biggest money makers for these titans of industry. And we needed iron to build the rails. We needed st- uh, steam engines. We needed coal. All that to say, a lot of people made money on the railway and the railway conditions, building railways, that is actually where a lot of unions uh, formed because it was just brutal work conditions. So not only in the railway, but also um, in a lot of these steel mills, um, coal, uh, coal mines, things like that, the conditions were brutal. So you're right, where a lot of these robber barons, depending on who you ask, or captains of industry, they wanted, they built these great things that we all use, but the way that they did it was often brutal. And I think that's what led to, like we mentioned, a lot of these perceived wrongs, which formed labor unions. Jay, did you want to mention anything about labor unions and how they began to form? Yeah. So like, like Colin was saying, as these industries were growing, the unskilled labor immigrants, um, working conditions were not that great. They were working super long days and uh, you know people were dying left and right to uh, to do all this stuff. And labor unions were the f- 
in my humble opinion, the first way in which socialism really starts to to take hold here in the United States. A lot of I, I've read some people that argue there's nothing inherently socialistic about a labor union, and you can be pro labor union and not a socialist. I would agree with that. However, labor unions are definitely the gateway drug to socialism. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's it's the concept behind it. You know, a labor union's strength is in the collective. Okay, it's the collective workers coming together in order to gain a, a desired end state i.e. better wages, workers' compensation, better working hours, things like that. And it, it, the first uh, – I mean the first strike occurred way before the second industrial revolution back in um, 1768. So even before the United States was formed, there was, a, there was an actual strike. And the first union was um, in 1794 with – uh, in Philadelphia, actually, uh, with the Federal Society of Journeymen and Cordwainers, which they make shoes. Um, so there is a a long history of unions, but uh, as Jay was saying, that uh, this is really where it takes off within these horrible conditions that they're working in. Um, you know, and some of the other labor unions and important strikes that we have. You know, we mentioned railways in the bad conditions. You know, in 1867, there were 2,000 uh, Chinese workers that went on strike uh, over poor wages. 1866, actually, just before that strike, there was the National Labor Union was was formed. The National Union for Cigar Makers also was formed, and it actually began accepting minorities um, like women and African Americans. Colin, those are those are some good examples of some early labor unions. Uh, the main tactic that these labor unions would use is called collective bargaining, and collective bargaining is essentially where instead of individually going to your employer and trying to renegotiate your contact or contract uh, or the the terms in which you're working for them, all the workers would band together. Uh, and they would collectively go to their employer and say, if you want any of us to continue to work, you have to give us an eight hour day. You have to increase our wages. You have to give me you know, a sick day, et cetera. Um, and then if the employer didn't comply and negotiations broke down, the workers would then go on strike. Yeah. And I think a couple of points, this was definitely revolved around specific industries like you had um like i mentioned the cord waners you had the brotherhood for uh locomotive um the blf you had it, it formed a lot around industry because you didn't have internet and i do want to make a point that it's it was not just industry specific but it was local it was like a grassroots movement and it wasn't really initially dominated by personalities and these giant titans it was very much hey things kind of <laughs> Hey, things kind of suck around here. We need to come together. And then another factor within unions that is really important is immigration and skilled versus unskilled labor. So within the industrial revolution, with the rise of machine labor, um, people became, you know, unskilled labor actually was kind of more in demand, if you will, because you didn't need a lot of people who were highly skilled at making guns and blacksmiths. That was all done by machine. You really just needed low skilled labor that was cheap to come in and monitor the machines. And then you'd have somebody supervising them and then somebody supervising the supervisors, birth and middle management. Um, so with immigration, the capitalist had a lot of unskilled labor that was really cheap that they could just Hey, come off the boat from Ireland. So within unions, there was a huge, there's a large amount of tension between um, your native, more skilled labor and Irish, African American, um, Chinese. So you had, there was a lot of conflict right there. And it was when it came down to what unions wanted to represent, the evolution of unions. Definitely, you know, we think of them now as very inclusive and initially they weren't inclusive. It was very much a native, okay, we're trying to protect our jobs. Anybody outside of us is not welcome. Um, so it, that took a long time. And I think the uh, the National Union for Cigar Makers was the first union to accept African-Americans and women. So, and that was in 1867. So, Interesting. Yeah. so Jay, the 
you know, that was, Hey, we, if you want to, that was kind of the positive, Hey, let's be more inclusive. Let's, mm. you know, begin. how are we going to answer this question of adding more people to our cause in this grassroots movement? So it gained a lot of popularity, um, and began growing. I think, um, what was it the the Knights of Labor went from just a couple members, like eight or nine, within like twenty years they had two hundred thousand members, so wildly popular. But you know, in this kind of constant ebb and flow between people, you know, the relationship between capitalists and socialists, where did socialism and these labor unions begin to fall out of favor? Right. So a lot of those, a lot of these unions, kind of began joining forces with other unions. uh, And there were a few, we talked about the Knights of Labor and the American Federation of Labor in our last episode, but there was also the Industrial Workers of the World, uh, known as Wobblies, and they they kind of formed. These big labor unions began to fall out of favor in the early 1900s when things started getting violent. So one one example of of this is in 1914 there was a mining colony in Ludlow, Colorado where um the the miners collectivized, unionized and um were going on strike and they had it was a, it was like a mining colony and so think of, there was like all these tents, you know, it wasn't like in a city or something like that. And the owner of the mine petitioned the governor of Colorado to call in the National Guard, uh, called in the National Guard, called in some other strike breakers, basically paid people to come in and rough up the strike, uh, the strikers and try to intimidate them. And uh, things kind of came to a head when some of the strikers killed four of the people who were guarding uh, the mine and the strike breakers and the national guard responded by basically firing indiscriminately with machine guns and throwing, you know, you know, 1914 versions of bombs into this tent colony. And they killed 26 people, including two women and 11 children. This became national news. Um, and it, and interestingly, it put the labor unions in a bad light because it, it was very much seen as if they didn't go on strike, this would have never happened. And because the strikers were the ones that initiated, they killed the four, the four guards and, and strike breakers. Um, the response by the national guard was kind of seen as justified. Um, so that was the beginning of where labor unions were kind of seen as this inherent, uh, disruption, um, and you know this outside evil that people didn't need to associate with. Yeah, I I would even say that's kind of the culmination of a lot of violence within these labor, really riots. At the you know started as a strike and became a riot. I mean, dating back, I think even thirty or forty years before that, you know, you had the Haymarket Square incident. Um, the Pullman strike where uh, it's Pullman strikes important because uh, Eugene Debs was, was involved in that with the, uh, the ARU and someone he supported with president Cleveland sent in troops and began firing into the, you know, firing into the crowd. So these labor strikes were very, da- not only were the working conditions pretty dangerous, but so were the strikes. Um, this was not any strike breakers. Um, it was not, like it was, these were very violent and very right. heated um, events. So it was significant. And, you know, at the time they didn't have social media and people with cameras and in, in their faces all the time, but they were very violent. Um, pre world star. Yeah. Pre world star. <laughs> didn't get, you know, I don't get to see union fights on world star, but you would have <laughs> because they're very violent. And yeah, you're right. I yeah. think that that was kind of the culmination where people and unions fell out of favor. And I don't want to jump too far ahead into the great depression and pre FDR where I think it's important to note also with this violence in these labor strikes, there was kind of an uneasy alliance between socialists and anarchists. And Jay, did you want to talk about that at all? Yeah, absolutely. So I think it's helpful to think of socialism as a spectrum. 
And the spectrum is kind of marked by whether or not you believe the current political structure is sufficient for introducing socialism to society. You either want to work it, work within the current political structure or you want to be revolutionary and bring down the current political structure in order to achieve socialist goals in society. The more radical end of that spectrum uh, of socialists, many of them were also anarchists. So anarchy as a political theory was also taking root at this exact same time. And its relationship with socialism uh, was was kind of blurry. Um, many early socialists were actually close friends and allies with anarchists. Uh, one example, one of the founders of the American Federation of Labor, the AFL, which still exists today, by the way, as the, as the AFL CIO, a gentleman named Samuel Samuel Gompers. He was uh, really good friends with a guy named Joseph Labadee, who was an anarchist and a labor organizer. And he was known for basically saying, hey, if we get rid of laws, men will abide by natural laws. I don't think he ever read early the found or many of the early founders. We talked about that in our <laughs> political theory of the American Revolution and how natural law plays into that. Uh, but uh, the, the point being is that anarchy Anarchists and socialists kind of formed an alliance in these early days, even though not all socialists are anarchists and not all anarchists are uh, socialists. Furthermore, there were quite a few early publications. So, uh, you know, we mentioned there's no such thing as the internet. There's no such thing as social media. And in addition to like newspapers, there were literary journals. Uh, there were pamphlets were huge uh for, for all of American history, like these independent publishers would just put stuff and distribute it out on the street. And a lot of uh, anarchistic socialist publications began showing up that were that were edited, published by anarchists promoting socialist uh, ideals. Just something yeah, you want to say, I, I think one of the... <laughs> You know, you're talking about publications, um, Upton Sinclair's The Jungle. So this wasn't like a newspaper or a pamphlet being passed out. This was a publication that even Winston Churchill praised. And Upton Sinclair was lambasted as a socialist uh, sympathizer and that he made it all up. But if you read The Jungle, and most people who have been through high school have probably read it, uh, it is a very this. It, it causes a very visceral reaction because you read about uh, you know workers basically going through these meat grinders and just becoming the food that people ate because they were you know the conditions were so bad butchers were getting their thumbs cut off and that was just thrown into the meat and it was just disgusting disgusting conditions right. for laborers, children, and then the product that they served people. People were really pissed about their food the being gross that they might actually be eating either at, at best dirty meat. Uh, at worst, they might mm -hmm. be eating another, you know, the meat might actually be a person or a body right. part. And the reaction that it caused actually led to uh, like the Pure Food and Drug Act. It, it led to a lot because people were so upset, A, about their food being gross, but also – like it, it caused a, the mainstream and most of middle America to come back and take a look and say, hey, maybe maybe these labor unions are right or maybe workers should be treated a little bit better. So there's right. kind of this competing sympathies going on right now. It's like, well, I don't really like these labor strikes and how violent they are, but I also think it's really bad how they're being treated. So that it's kind of an interesting competing uh, – competing thoughts amongst the American people on, on how they viewed socialists and workers like that. But I will say when you talk about publications, that might've been one of the most successful ones when it came to yeah. improving working conditions. Yeah, absolutely. Um, the, the last thing here, and I really only bring this up because the anniversary uh, was last week. Um, and, and that was, you know, the kind of peak, Anarchy. 
uh, here in the United States was in, in 1901 when an anarchist assassinated the president, <laughs> uh, a dude who I also discovered why nobody says this guy's name. Uh, you know, it's like, we all know who Lee Harvey Oswald and John Wilkes Booth are, but we never hear the guy's name that assassinated uh, McKinley. And he was, I think he was a Polish born immigrant. I'm going to try to say his name. I think it's Leon Cholgaz. Uh, spelled C Z O L G O S Z. Please, if, if somebody if Polish, wants to correct please. me, if you're Polish, <laughs> please help me. Um, I, I, de- I never understand. It's like the Poles pronounce the the C Z's one way and the Czechs pronounce it a different way. I, I'm sorry, uh, but anyway, this guy was an anarchist uh, and he assassinated um, uh, President McKinley in order to you know encourage the the people to revolt and introduce anarchy, but. Um, that's that's kind of this time again there was there was a little apprehension towards socialism you know talk about red scares uh in 19 in 1901 the bolsheviks had not yet taken over russia um so the any any apprehension towards uh this extreme uh leftist political viewpoint hadn't quite happened yet so uh that's that's kind of the the synopsis of the the alliance between the anarchists and the socialists. Jay, I think this is a a good a good stopping point for today. There's just, there's just so much that we can discuss, but um, you know, just to summarize this episode and some of the takeaways that we covered, this is really a pivotal moment in American history for workers because it, it like like we mentioned in the beginning, it changed the way we we worked. Gone were the days of the agrarian society. In were the days of the workers working uh, rather than the, for their livelihood, for their wages. Um, and some of you know the socialists also, you know, this movement was a reaction to perceived wrongs. And in a lot of ways, they were very right. And what we have today, in a lot of ways, is because of these this movement, um, things that we often take for granted. Um, you know, so we can see that these labor unions forming. They continued on into today, and they had some powerful collective bargaining, Labor Day, minimum wage, child um, child labor laws. All of these things were formed because of this collective bargaining of these workers and the um, evolution and growth that they um, that occurred during this time period. I think it's important to take a look back and see um, some of their grievances, which were terrible working conditions terrible wages and really not just bad wages, but a lot of times it was unpredictable wages. They would just suddenly, their wages would drop. Uh, They would be replaced by uh, immigrant labor. So there's all these competing factors that they had to come together um, in this grassroots style movement and bargain uh, with this growing industrial capitalist um, class in order to achieve those goals. And I think it's important to recognize that. So And then for next week, so we left off at about the turn of the century. So next week, we're actually going to go back and talk um, kind of on the capitalist side of the narrative. You know, we mentioned the two narratives um, that we really only talked about one today. So we're going to talk about the other side, the booming middle class, the consumer class, the titans of industry, if you will, and kind of their perspective of all of this before we continue on any further. So, Jay. Yeah, no, that was good. Um, Again, I hope... I hope this helps everyone kind of understand where the other side's coming from. Uh, doesn't mean we have to agree with it, but to understand like this stuff doesn't come out of a vacuum. So Colin, thank you for that summary. Uh, I don't know about y'all, but I have really enjoyed learning uh, about how socialism kind of took hold here in the United States. Uh, it's fascinating to me that, uh, for example, that Ludlow, Colorado uh, mining um, incident, they were going on strike because they wanted an eight hour work day. That was it. And 26 people lost their lives. Uh, well, 30 total. Uh, so to me, this is fascinating because we're still talking about the exact same stuff. We're still talking about the minimum wage. We're still talking about, you know, a, a four day work week, five versus a five day work week versus, you know, whatever. Um, and this, this is how this stuff got started. So thank you. Thanks, Colin, for giving that uh, 
that summary. Hey, if you've if you like what we're doing here, if you like listening to us, uh, please consider supporting us. We're we're on social media. We've got a Facebook page. We're on Twitter. We're on Instagram. Just search for Loins of History. There's also links in the show note if you want to look at our look at our handles. Yeah, please consider uh, liking our pages um, and following us on social media. You can also support this podcast if you like what we're doing. We're not a big fan of advertisements. Uh, We have a Patreon page. The link is in the show notes. Uh, Click that link. Support us on Patreon. It's only five bucks a month and you get extra content. You get to see uh, our sources. um, We share... uh, we do exclusive uh, Q and A with myself and with Colin. Uh, we have a separate podcast mini series where we do um, Patreon only, like ten minute episodes, kind of giving some extra stuff. Uh, where, uh, like Colin did one on the Supreme Court. One of the future plans one we have uh, is on like famous battles in history. So if you just like if you're a history junkie like us, you can hear about that. Um, Thank you for listening. Thank you for uh, for for following us on on this podcast, and we really hope uh, that you like what you hear. If you have any feedback, either positive or negative, comment, send us a message, send us a DM. Please, please, please get in touch with us somehow and let us know what you liked. Let us know what you disliked, and above all, leave us a review, a five star rating. It really helps get the get the show out to listeners like yourself. Again, thank you, and we look forward to seeing you next week on the Lawrence of History. 